Welcome back to the Stay Room Only Podcast, episode 125. We have a decent bit to talk about today. There's been some MLB trades. Uh, next week's episode is going to be loaded with probably the majority of them. We have a couple extensions in the NFL with some wide receivers. Also, a little controversy with uh, the Kyler Murray contract. As always, though, you can follow our social media at SR Only Pod on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and you can follow our personal pages. Mine is at the Healy Six. And I am iGoose with four O's in the middle there. Go ahead and hit that follow button. We're on Spotify, we're on a podcast as well. But Healy, as you said, we are it's it's August 1st. If you're listening to this, we're recording July 31st, Sunday night. August 1st is tomorrow. Trade deadline is amongst us in the MLB. A lot of trades so far, quite a few trades. Let's put it that way. Baseball, I feel like it's always loaded with trades. Yeah, Some it's, it's just what happens every single year. You got to get value for your guys that you are unsure of getting re-signing. There's always going to be younger guys coming up through your farm system, and it takes a lot to make a team good. So a lot of teams also just can't retain guys in the future because they aren't going to be good enough. And uh, while there's while those players are still good for them. Yeah, we've already seen Luis Castillo get traded, which is the big one for now. And why it's so big, they got no they got their num- uh Seattle's number 1 and 4 prospects. Noel V Marte, who's a middle infielder. They got Edwin Arroyo, and then also included in the deal is Andrew Moore and Levy Stout. They handed the Reds a handful of uh, prospects that are really good in their farm system. And Luis Castillo, he has a year and a half left. Uh, The Mariners aren't really making a push for this year, but I think they snagged Luis Castillo because he was going somewhere just to prepare for for next year because they already signed Robbie Ray uh, to start the year. They already have some guys in the minors that could – come into the rotation and the rotation's kind of solid to it anyways. I think it's a good move. I mean, we're seeing one of arguably his best seasons yet in Luis Castillo. He's got a 2.86 ERA. His strikeout count is always high. I mean, he's been doing that with Cincinnati. One of the biggest things for, for me is we've seen, we saw last year, Seattle, in a way, was a surprise team. They're proving that they want to compete. We're seeing some guys start to shine. Uh, Julio Rodriguez, rookie, doing extremely well in his rookie year. The bats all around are pretty good. But the pitching staff is also pretty damn good. Their starting rotation is not bad. As you mentioned, Robbie Ray. They have Gonzalez. They just added Luis Castillo. They're in the Logan wild card Gilbert. Hunt. Logan Gilbert too. Yeah, they're in the the thing is though, they're in the wild card hunt. Are they gonna could they potentially be a threat in a playoff series? I think they could. I actually think they could. I thought they were pretty good last year. They have a solid team still this year and they added to it. Are there better teams in the AL? Absolutely. I would put my money on the Yankees or the Astros. I mean, I still think that's going to be my ALCS prediction, but I I like the move and like you said, you get a whole nother year out of Luis Castillo as well. So, yeah, you know, with free agency coming up, there wasn't too many big names. Uh, we also saw a couple minor moves. One I thought was really good. It wasn't even a trade. Joe Musgrove was supposed to be a free agent this off season, and the Padres gave him a five year, one hundred million dollar extension. Really good. Because a pitcher like him hits the free agency market, and due to lack of talent in the market, he was going to be like the top starting pitcher or one of, and probably get twenty eight million a year. He's only getting paid twenty million a season to stick around in San Diego. He just must love that organization and area. Who wouldn't love San Diego? <laughs> In general, <laughs> exactly, especially with the uh, the other talent that's around him. The team is notorious for going all in and trying to build a, a 
what we can call a dynasty, I guess. I mean, they should be competing for as many years down the road as long as Tatis gets healthy and stays healthy. They have, they signed Manny Machado to a huge deal a few years back. And then, you know, you add in guys like that. And so I think it's a good move. You're you're still in the NL. I mean, the, the only downside is you're stuck in the, in the West, which is always going to be a tough division. But this is a team that's going to compete for the next few years. And we may end up seeing them in, in, in the big dance one of these upcoming years. And Musgrove, I mean, it, it's a win-win situation. It's a win-win for the, the Padres. It's a win for him. I mean, 25 million a year is obviously still a lot, as you mentioned. Him 20. being one of the... Or 20, I'm sorry, you're right. 20 million a year. That's very team-friendly. So in a way, it's like saying, hey, now go out there and, and try to maybe get somebody else in the offseason. We'll see who, I mean, not too many guys available, but... I think it's a good move. Very good move. Still waiting on the Cubs moves. It, it's just the writing on the wall at this point with Wilson Contreras and uh, Ian Happ. Cubs did make a trade, though. The Dodgers got Chris Martin from the Cubs. I'm surprised Chris Martin was the first reliever gone from the Cubs. David Robertson is the hot commodity for relief pitching, closer type guy. But Chris Martin... Goes to the Dodgers, and the Cubs get back Zach McKinstry, which I think is a great trade for the Cubs. McKinstry, not really a household name, but he's been in the minors in L.A. L.A. is a powerhouse team. You have to be the best of the best to get playing time. McKinstry could easily get playing time with the Cubs. He's a utility guy. Uh, his hitting has just been okay. But I think a majority of that is just because he hasn't gotten the consistent playing time. Like this year, he has an 091 average. He has a 649 OPS. And it's because in 10 games, he has 14 plate appearances. He's just pinch hitting against great relievers. It's not enough. It's not enough. But with being going to the north side, He's bound to to get a lot more playing time, especially at the end of the year. We know they're not competing clearly, but I'm still excited. I don't know if I want to say excited, but I'm curious to know. I don't even think it's an if at this point. It's almost guaranteed that Wilson's gone. Ian Happ's gone. Wilson already took down all of his Cubs. They're back. Uh, oh, they are back. Okay, so he added Some them of back. them are back, okay. but there, okay. there was a blackout period. Okay, so I think... Uh, I think Cubs fans have already uh, accepted it, and Wilson Contreras has accepted it. It's kind of crazy that the team that they had, and now they're they're kind of going through this rebuild. But it's just a matter of time. Do, what's the exact time or the day for the trade deadline? It's the first, right? Or am I crazy? It this year it is. It's normally July thirty first. This year though, it is August second, which is Tuesday. Oh, okay. And it is, let's see what time, 6 p.m. Eastern. Okay. So middle of the day, Tuesday, 5 p.m. Central time. Have your eyes glued to the TV because there's going to be a lot of, I, I assume most trades are going to be done way before that, but. I, I Last year, Javi Baez and Bryant got traded like half hour before the deadline. Oh, man. Most of the time, these these players will not get traded until the deadline because the teams want the best deal possible. And when yeah, the deadline's finally offers, there, yeah. then they'll finally accept one. Hopefully, the Cubs can bring in some more talent, whether if it's future prospects, whatever it may be. I mean, they've gone through and... I mean, they had, they've had solid players. They still have solid guys. In, the, in that organization right now as it is. I mean, even when they traded uh, Kimbrell last year, and then now they have Dan Robertson, who's probably going to be gone. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do with these two guys here. Maybe it'll be a package. There's going to be, they're probably going to go to win now teams, especially Contreras having a pretty solid year. Ian it, Happ was an all-star. It's seeming like Contreras and Robertson will be packaged together. Okay, okay. But the tough part about Wilson, too, is like, being a catcher, he has to relearn all the pitching staff. But whoever gets him will probably use him as a hitter. 
And one of the teams was the Mets, but I don't know if the Mets are really in on it anymore because they traded for Daniel Vogelbach. Yep. He was a big bat out of Pittsburgh. He was hitting pretty decent. He's a left-handed bat. He could DH, play first base. They traded him for Colin Holder Holderman, who had a decent ERA this season, but they just felt the need, like, he wasn't a part of the championship this season and necessarily needed. So who knows where these guys will go. We'll figure that out on Tuesday. We also saw David Peralta, longtime Diamondback, go to the Rays. I was I was going to say lifetime Diamondback, but I think he came into the league as a pitcher. He got out of the league, and then he came back as a hitter and played very well from then. So he went to the Rays. The Rays have voodoo ma- magic in Tampa. That's why they're probably isolated from everyone in Pensacola or wherever they're at, actually. And he got traded for a catcher, Christian Serta. Didn't get the best value. Uh, Serta's 19. This article says he's a prospect worth keeping an eye on. But basically... Peralta's getting old. They don't have much control, and they just took a player that they thought could potentially turn into something, but not like a guarantee. Added another bat to that team that continues to play pretty damn good baseball considering the division that they're in. So maybe it'll help, maybe it won't. I guess we'll see. Mm Mm-hmm. We also saw another Mets trade. Mets have made a decent amount of moves so far. There's three. Yep. We're only going to talk about one other trade, though, with them. They got Tyler Naquin and Philip Deal from the Reds. Deal is a left-handed reliever. Not bad to get a left-handed reliever. And Tyler Naquin, good lefty bat out of Cincinnati. They're just adding the lefty bats to the lineup. Another outfielder. And I, it'll be a solid pickup. I don't think he does well against lefties, but they're making sure their lineup will be strong against left-handers and right-handers. They gave up a couple prospects, Jose Acuna and Hector Rodriguez. Haven't heard of them before. I wouldn't be surprised if the Mets are involved in a couple other trades. The other main one, I'm not going to say this is the biggest, but the main one that's happened so far, the Yankees got Andrew Benintendi which helps them out. That pretty much means that Joey Gallo's time in New York is done. Joey Gallo will most likely get traded to another team. He's just played so poorly. He needs a new scenery, like needs some new scenery. He knows it himself. He admitted in an interview, like he just hasn't played his best. There's nothing really behind it. He owned up to it. And Based off his history and knowing, like, I don't know about anxiety, but yeah, he's somewhat like that, where I feel like the big New York market and stuff just is too much. too much. Yeah. Yep. And it's tough, too, because a big left-handed bat like that, you would expect in New York to sit there and hit 40 home runs every year, batting uh, 199. He just can't hit the ball. And it's it's a thing. It's it's definitely a thing. I mean, we talk about the yips and other things within baseball and obviously other sports as well. But yeah, that's a huge acquisition for them to get Ben and then who was obviously with Kansas City doing his thing. He was with Boston before. He's pretty good, solid left-handed bat, and I'm sure he's going to do wonders compared to to Joey Gallo. So it'd be interesting to see uh, to see what they get in return for Joey Gallo, assuming he is on the way out. Uh, Because obviously the Yankees, as of right now, are looking to be the best team in the league, even though the Astros have their number this season. But with that being said, this move kind of, to me, says, all right, now we're we're foolproof. Now we got our lefty bats. We have Aaron Judge smacking, at this rate, 65 home runs for all we know this year. And everybody else, Rizzo and and all those guys in the lineup, and it's just and the pitching on top of that is is I mean, Rollis Chapman's been looking pretty solid. Uh, they have him coming in as like a middle or a setup man, and I, I still like the Yankees. I think this is a good move for them. 
And it helps out because they stole Ben Benintendi from, I guess, the Blue Jays, but the Blue Jays were no longer in on him because of COVID restrictions. But another competitive team was going to get Ben Benintendi, and this just helps him out in the long run or for the rest of the year. And it's good to see Ben Benintendi bounce back a little bit because he got shipped off to Kansas City. Pretty much he got shipped off to Siberia. Uh, because he just couldn't perform as well with the, the Red Sox, and now he's back with the evil empire. The greater good out of the AL East, as of right now. We'll put it that way. Yeah, with that, though, that, that's all the, the MLB trade deadline news. Aaron Judge, the main man at the moment, he's had a fantastic year, and a lot of people think he's the MVP frontrunner. With 42 home runs currently on pace for 66, which he'd be the ninth person to hit the uh, the 60 mark ever. And this is his year. They he didn't sign a deal. This is his final year before he comes a free agent, and he's gonna win big based off this this year he's having. He's gonna get paid, no doubt. I. I wouldn't be surprised with how hot his bat has been since basically the second week of June. I mean, he's been smacking home runs left and right. We've seen him do it year after year. But at this point, the way he's kicked it up a notch, if he continues at the rate he's had at least for the last couple of weeks, he's probably going to push closer to 70. I want him to break Barry Bonds record just because what I mean records for one are meant to be broken and for two which I love Barry Bonds should be a hall of famer he's a hall of famer my and you know obviously all that but for two it's so exciting to see this is what makes baseball fun is when guys are chasing these records that seem unbreakable that seem unbreakable like 73 is kind of crazy to me like that is one of the craziest, obviously, all-time home runs. Okay, maybe, maybe not. If Judge stays healthy, he might be able to 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 work his way to that. There's a lot of other guys, obviously, Tatis. He needs if he can stay healthy. He's very young. If he can do his 40 home runs multiple times, yada yada yada. But the single season, what we have right now, and it's in the air. A couple multi-home run games later, and now we're like, okay. He's pushing 70 all of a sudden. And I mean, it's still, this is July 31st. He didn't hit one today uh, in their game against Kansas City. Going into August 1st, you have practically 60 days, let's call it, give or take a couple of days, with a chance to hit. Well, 30 will put him at right there. He's at 42, so he's 31 to tie. Yeah. Can he do it? I think it, it, he can get close. I don't know if he'll hit 70. I don't think he'll hit 70, but if he does get close, I will be watching probably every game down the stretch. We already a know 60 they're taking the division. home run mark would be sick because I think that would be the first since like McGuire and Bonds and all them did it in Sosa. Did A Rod ever hit 60? Or was he almost 57? I think it's 57. Uh, I'll tell you right now. Yeah, he had 57 with Texas in 2002, where he finished second MVP. And he had 54 in his MVP season with the New York Yankees. Oh, okay. So he, okay, that's right. That's right. 50. I don't know why I knew 57. I don't know why I tied that to A-Rod, but. And also Stanton had 59. In his his year, where he went off in twenty sixteen or seventeen, so he is going to be the first in twenty in about twenty years, yeah, to hit sixty. And you know what the funny thing is too? It's not really funny, but there's a few guys where if we had to make a wild guess to hit close to sixty, we have a handful of guys now. There's quite a few in the league. You have Judge, who's probably going to get close quite a few few years. Stanton, teammate. Uh, Shohei, depending on the type of bad, I mean, he's still dangerous. The last year we saw him hit what 47 or so. Um, Pete Alonzo. I don't know. I guess I'm not going to throw Eloy up there. Eloy's never healthy enough. Eloy's never his, his home run rate's high, but it's not, he's never healthy enough. 
But there's mm-hmm. at least five guys in the league just about that now we're like, okay, we might actually get 60 a few times. So yeah, the, the last person to do it was Bonds and Sosa in 2001. With 73 and 64. Wow. So Sosa had a... He competed with Bonds. Bear, they, there needs to be Sammy, a 30 for Sammy 30. Sosa has two of the top five home run seasons ever. Or he has three of the top six home run seasons ever. All three of them, he finished second in the league. Wow. So he's 1998. McGuire had 70. So said 66. 99. So said 63. McGuire had 65. And then 2001. Sosa had 64. Bonds had 73. That's nuts. That's literally unheard of right there. And I know there's the steroid era, but still. And that's where the disrespect in trying to get Sammy Sosa into the Hall of Fame comes in, where you see how good of a stretch he had at one point. And he better than he, better than most in the Hall of Fame. There's a lot of guys in the Hall of Fame who made it just because of their longevity. I uh yeah, that's tough. I mean, Sosa obviously got caught corking his bat and so on and so forth. So yeah, he, he almost ruined that reputation for him. But he was the man for a while. That that Chicago that 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 Cubs team throughout the mid late nineties when they had Kid K, they Greg Maddox at one point, Moise Salu in 03, and Derek Lee, all those guys. To me, being a Sox fan, I was like, okay, this is actually kind of fun to watch. The Sox, you know, obviously were so hit or miss depending on the year. That Cubs team was actually pretty fun to watch, and Sosa led that, but so Judge. Back to the main topic, MVP, leader, we can call it. But there's, a, there's always a good argument for Shohei, right? Yeah. I mean, we talked about it. You, you, you had some statistics on that with his war. I mean, you have a guy that can literally is one of the best pitchers. His, look at his last 10 games. He's probably struck out at least 10 guys every game. I don't know if that's accurate. It's pretty close. But then you also get a guy who's very dangerous at the plate. And arguably is as valuable to the angels as Mike Trout just about. Yeah. But it's got to be like, yeah, I think him and Mike Trout are similar in war. I don't know what Mike Trout has on all these formulas, but he just generates war as if it's like nothing. Trout's just unnatural. I mean, that's just like, well, so would Shohei, I guess Shohei would be a natural, right? Yeah. Both. But Shohei, he does have a good argument. It's tough, though, because everyone loves the narrative. They love the Aaron Judge. New York Yankees are the best team in the league. He's just killing it. But also Shohei won the award last year, so the the effect of it this year isn't the same because Vlad had a very good season last year. He did. He did. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. had a sixth season. He had 311 batting average, 401 on base, 601 slugging. He finished with a thousand OPS. He had 48 homers. He had 111 RBIs. He led the league in runs. But playing first base hurt him there. And it's just he had finished with 6.8 WAR. Aaron Judge is going to finish with more WAR, but it, it's kind of like last year. And Guerrero wasn't even a, a conversation for MVP. And now Shohei isn't. He's up there. He's gonna he's gonna end up finishing second, third. I don't I don't even know who else is really up there in the AL. There's nobody that I can think of. I mean, if we were talking Cy Young, like, yeah, there's other guys for Cy Young, but Aaron Judge has my vote. Aaron Judge has my vote for AL MVP. We'll talk about MVPs as it gets down towards the end of the season. We'll do our predictions, obviously, but I think it. It's just amazing what Aaron Judge is doing. 60s on the radar. 60 plus is on the radar. I feel like 60 is a gimme at this point. 18 home runs in two months of baseball. Mm hmm. So. Yeah, and you got with Shohei, he throws 100 miles an hour. That's. Yeah. Very impressive with that. 
Speaking of contracts, though, uh, with Aaron Judge, we're going to make a transition over to the NFL with a couple big extensions. Before we get into those, though, a lot of people had a lot of flack on Kyler Murray, including Kyler Murray himself. The clauses in his deal where he had to have four said that correctly, four hours of independent study. Yeah, weekly, right? Yeah, game game week, yep. That's so nuts. I know we talked about it before and how crazy that is. I think that it's a little, It to me it should be assumed. That's what you're, you're paying as an organization. You're paying somebody to assume that they're going to go all in for themselves and for the organization as well to put that into the clause of the contract. It's one thing to talk about, okay, you're this position. We need to keep you at this percent body fat. Like this is important to me. That makes a little more sense as weird of a clause that can be like we saw, like we saw with Zion in the NBA is class time or independent study in a way is like, it's just normal, unheard of. It's, it's just unheard just, of. It's what people should normally be doing. It's assumed. Yeah, it should be assumed. So it was kind of weird. But so they pulled it. Up here. They, I don't know if it was yesterday. They pulled it off the clause. They're like, you know what? Goofy us. Why would we do that? You know, to our star. Because it yeah. looks bad, right? To me, it looks bad. It looks like yeah. they, they have a problem with his study habits. And maybe they're, maybe this ends up backfiring. And they, they need to have that in the clause. We'll see. But I think, I mean, he's got the tangibles. We know he's arguably one of the best quarterbacks in the league. He's in playing in one of the tough divisions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the they removed it, but the intent was there from the beginning, and now everyone knows it as well, and Kyler knows it. So if he messes up, that's where people are going to go now. Yes, yeah. he's studying. Oh, yeah. There's also a TikTok I saw from Barstool Big Cat. And he was talking about, I, Kyler is a big 2K player. I see him all the time playing 2K and like playing in these leagues and he's one of the highest scores. But Kyler Murray in games before Call of Duty comes out, he has a 24 fantasy points per game. After Call of Duty releases, he has 17 fantasy points per game. Oh, that's a crazy stat. Yo, shout out to whoever pulled that stat because that that's that explains my fantasy season taking a dump last year. I drafted him pretty high and I was excited. Well, and the Cardinals started out hot last year. They did. They did. Did they even make the playoffs? I think they did. They did. They the, the Seahawks playoffs, didn't. Sure. The Seahawks crumbled. Yeah. Well, Russell Wilson got hurt, but yeah, they definitely crumbled. And now, what's the excuse going to be? They can always put the blame on Hopkins being out. They have uh, got rid of Christian Kirk, right? So we'll see. I think he'll. I think they'll still be good. But that's that's an interesting stat. His fantasy points. That's a lot. That's an eight point difference. That's a your mediocre quarterbacks, your late round quarterbacks, your your uh, Mitch Trubisky's, if you will are your 16, 17, 18 point guys. 18's on the better side, I'd say, obviously, but that's 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 an interesting stat. Another contract news though. We saw DK Metcalf get an extension. 3 years, 70 something million dollars. He got the highest bonus ever for a wide receiver of 30 million. And he is sticking around in Seattle. He's still young. He's still, when he's done with that contract, he'll still be a decent age. But it's weird how they have no quarterback. Their team just isn't great. And he was a great trade piece that they the Seahawks were re-signed him. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's a very good move. And so they're going to get him through, I believe the end of 25 i could be wrong 2025 which is going to make him 27 28 years old still going to be in his prime the dude is a freak in nature as far as athleticism we see his stature he's very strong very fast just a damn good athlete so 
it paints it what makes you wonder right like you're gonna go all in on this receiver when you're kind of in a rebuild and they're gonna be in a rebuild but then you have other you have tyler lockett who's also a decently paid receiver who's their who's their quarterback drew lock yeah as of now drew lock so is there something maybe does dk McCaff? well for one it makes sense for him to take the deal because of the bonus money. Yeah, it's just because You're, of the money is there. He's guaranteed like fifty-eight million out of the contract. He's getting a thirty million dollar bonus signing that he gets like up front. I'm pretty sure. So it's like, okay, I'll do three. I'll do an extend my contract three more years. I'm gonna be probably the top target. We're gonna be playing from behind most games because well, our team sucks now. So ultimately, my numbers are going to be up. So yeah, let's do it. I'm going to do this extension. My numbers are going to look great more times than not, hopefully, as long as Drew Lock can at least paint the picture here and there. And then after that, he's got one more big contract in him. And if his numbers are even remotely close to what they have been, he's going to get another huge deal. It's just up to Seattle now to see like, now I'm curious to know what is, what's their next move. We saw Chris Carson was forced to retire because of the neck injury. They don't really have a running game. They don't have a passing game as far as I'm concerned. Maybe Drew Locke surprises us. Defense is still, they got burnt. They got burnt last year quite a bit. No, They have Adams at safety. I don't even know who else they have at this point. So it's an interesting one for sure, considering a lot of teams have made big moves to kind of move guys around. We saw Devontae Adams get traded. Uh, that was an interesting move, I guess. Uh, but when you're in a rebuild, it's, they could have gotten picked for him. They could have gotten young talent. Young. I mean, he's pretty young, right? So I guess it, I guess it makes sense. Yeah, I guess they would rather just see what what they have with him instead of getting a second round pick who potentially doesn't do anything. Yep. And then we saw San Francisco, same division, give out another massive wide receiver contract. Three years, seventy one point like three three million to Debo Samuel. He gets the yep. money he was looking for, fifty eight million guaranteed. He's staying in San Fran, and it, that's a good decision for San Francisco, especially because he wanted out so that he could get that wide receiver role and make more money. But the team decided to pay him like a wide receiver, and he still might have that same role that he he has had where. He is kind of like a running back wide receiver hybrid. I think it's a great move. I think the 49ers are still going to compete. I assume Trey Lance is going to be the starting quarterback moving forward. We'll see to be determined. And Debo just produces so well in that offense. For him to get that deal, it just makes sense. Not only does it guarantee him one of the highest paid receivers in the game. But you're also still on a team that's going to contend. You have a very good defensive team. I just think his role where he is in the backfield just makes sense considering his athleticism. And we see it with other teams where the receiver does run the ball, not as much as Debo Samuel. So hopefully they give him a little break there and make him more of a primary receiver, but it just works. It works so well for them, um, especially when they did have the three-headed monster running uh, running back core. So I guess we'll see what what, for, what the 49ers end up doing. But to me, they're still going to contend. But again, it's, it's a very tough division over there in the West Coast. So Did you just mention Trey Lance is now the quarterback? Is he is he the starter moving forward? Yes, I know Kyle still... Shanahan has officially and the owner John Lynch or whatever they've officially come out and said Trey Lance is the guy moving forward. Good, they know now. They know that's what I mean. I know that they want the quarterback competition and whatnot a lot of times, but they they went all in on Trey Lance in the draft. It, this is their this is their window. It's. If if he ends up being a bust, so be it. I don't think he will. But while the defense is good, while players are healthy, you bring back Debo, the running game's still going to be good. I think this is it. I think Trey Lance is going to help give him that extra push. I think they're going to be a tough-ass team, not only in the regular season, but even as a wild-card team. Say they don't take the division as a wild-card team. If they sneak into the playoffs, 
there's not many teams that can beat the 49ers. There's literally, I consider them better than Dallas. Dallas is obviously generally a, a gimme in the East. Green Bay has troubles with the 49ers like every year, as long as Aaron Rodgers is their quarterback, even though Green Bay on paper is the better team statistically. So I like, I like, Trey Lance there, and I'm 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 excited to see what Trey Lance does. I, I might have to look at him as a as a mid round flyer for my fantasy. Maybe it may, I don't know if anybody's gonna go pick him up right right away. He's probably gonna be one of the late rounds, so maybe I'll sneak him and stash him in my bench just to see what he does. Sneaky signing was uh, the Bears signed someone. They signed an offensive lineman this this week. I saw. I did not see that, but I did see Tevin Jenkins trending, and they signed Riley Reef, who uh, used to be with, I think, the Bucks. Oh, he was with the Bengals. That's who it was. Interesting. Okay, he was and with Cincinnati uh, last year, and then he was with Minnesota before. And then Detroit. Teams that produce. Teams that produce. And is he offensive line? He's a tackle. So okay. now they're going to have... Uh, who is, they're going to have that one guy from the Eagles. Oh, oh. He's really old. I got the depth chart being pulled up here. Uh, Tevin Jenkins. Feeling. Tevin Jenkins. Well, Tevin Jenkins was the rookie from oh, last year. Uh, who? Did they not have this guy anymore? Tevin Jenkins is the new one. Oh, he must be. Peters. Jason Peters was there last year. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. He provided some good. He provided some good. Uh, good games. The depth chart right now has, and they signed Michael Schofield, or they got him from somewhere. But the Bears have, like, Larry Borum, who's one of their top picks. He's technically second string, which I guess isn't bad for O-line when one of your top-rated guys doesn't have a spot. Yeah, it'll could be, be Could be good, see. could be bad, but injuries happen. Guys are going to get playing time regardless. Well, Tevin Jenkins has he's been a no-show. Apparently, there's a huge disconnect with him and the coaches. He's still hurt. So maybe he ends up sliding into that number one spot. And that could explain the signing there as well. Kind of a bummer considering he had a lot of high praise uh, being drafted in the first. Was he first round? Second round pick? He was the top two pick. Well, they got Justin Fields, and then they got Tevin Jenkins like the round after. Yeah, so the Bears offense actually, looking at their depth chart, doesn't look bad. Their defense, to me, has got to be very, very shaky. But I like David Montgomery. I think he's bound to have a huge year. Justin Fields, learning the offense, gets his, you know a year behind him. Darnell Mooney, there's talks of him being that guy. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. I thought he had a pretty solid year last year. Over 1,000 yards, 81 catches. They bring in Byron uh, Pringle, who had played with previously with Kansas City, super fast receiver. Top so they run got blocker. Speed. Yeah, top run blocker. Cole Kmet, I think, is a good tight end. I think he's bound to have a good year as well. See if they utilize him. I mean, if they're driving, here's the thing. As long as they're moving the football, whether if they're running, Cole Kmet's going to be good in the red zone. He's going to be very good in the red zone. He's got hands. He's got size. So it's just that defense is, yeah, they're going to get torched. Yeah, uh, the Bears, I think I saw the schedule finally released. People are saying, like, they could win six games or so, which wouldn't be bad, but not great, considering there's 17 games now in the season. Was there any NBA news? I don't think yes. so. I think, uh, yeah? Well, not really transactions, but Bill Russell passed away at the age of 88. Oh, yeah. Sadly, but peacefully. Uh, so rest in peace to a legend, to literally one of the goats and pioneers of the league. Uh, on and off the court, obviously, did a lot. Um, 
He's like and the first like big legend. But besides besides Kobe, that was a, just an unfortunate event. Mm -hmm. Where you're, you're, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's like the first legend to me that's passed away. That's impacted the game. He's been like a top ten guy you could throw in. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, as far as like being on Mount Rushmore of the NBA, uh, I know that uh, Wilt Chamberlain passed ninety nine. So Wilt Chamberlain. I wasn't old enough to really know. Yeah. In 99, but as far as like the Mount Rushmore, Wilt Chamberlain, Bill Russell, those guys that kind of paved the way, obviously besides Kobe. Um yeah, he's the first, yeah, the first one that I have known for so long now that I've been a basketball fan for the last 20 plus years. And I mean, what 14 championships 11 championships i don't even know what it was but i mean he 11, dominated yeah yeah 11 championships he dominated and as a celtic and obviously is arguably top five of all time you generally top five on everybody's list top 10 at the very least so rest in peace to him and Definitely just like the nba wasn't really a thing until the 60s so it's still such a young league that the guys that played then they're they're only 88, like Bill Russell was. He's yeah. the earliest like guy to be playing in the NBA. He's he's 88. <laughs> kind of weird to think about, right? Because you have all the other sports where guys were playing in the late 1800s. Yeah, or they were playing in like the 1930s, 40s, stuff like that. It's weird to think about. But yeah, so rest in peace to Bill Russell. That's That's it for basketball. I don't have any basketball news. We don't have any basketball news, I should say. Uh, at least not yet. Summer League had just finished recently. We're going to start to see eventually. Probably not a whole lot. There's still some guys to sign. We'll see. I know Colin Sexton. They're, they're, we'll see what ends up happening with him and a few other guys. Um, and then some other probably uh, not so notable players still to sign with teams. But we're at the point where... We got another few weeks before we start looking at preseason, probably four, five, six weeks before we start to roll into preseason. Um, one, this is the last, the last few weeks before we, you know, we'll have NFL seasons are going to be starting soon. NBA obviously rolls in right after that, about a month after, month and a half or so. NHL is going to be rolling around again. Baseball playoffs are going to be right around the corner, so it's it's about to it's about to get fun for us. Let's put it that way. It's about to get very fun for us, sports fans, our you know fanatics. Chicago Sox, I think, are still going to sneak into the playoffs. I think it's going to be a fun playoffs uh, for for me. Maybe disappointing because of who potentially my face, but Lonzo Ball apparently rumor is he's starting to look healthy. They're they're saying he actually might be good to go by the start of the year. That's just a rumor. We'll see. But yeah, we got a few weeks and we're going to have a lot more to talk about. We're going to have probably hour and a half episodes. <laughs> Love hearing the Lonzo Ball news, especially with yeah. the, the concern that it was a lot worse than it was. I don't know how official it was, so I didn't want to. Okay. I, I wasn't sure yeah. if I wanted to bring it up. But apparently, according to his dad, it's a, it's going well and they're targeting start of the season. Do we trust what the, 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 the rumor or what his dad is saying? I don't know. I, I take it with a grain of salt, I guess. But getting healthy Lonzo back, you look at his numbers and you just don't understand what it just doesn't justify what he brings to that Bulls team. So that plus minus probably would. So mm -hmm. that'll do it, though, for this episode. As always, you can follow us on social media at SR Only Pod. You can follow our personal pages. Mine is at the Healy Six. And I'm iGoose with four O's. Hit that follow button. Let's talk sports.